Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video, and I'm going to focus really on one thing in this, which is going through uh, an interview with uh, Julia Ioff that she gave to PBS. And this was recorded back in September last year, but they've just, I think, released a full-length version now. Such, such a good interview. Jam-packed full of nuggets and interesting bits and pieces what i'm going to show you is is actually selected parts from that to do with american presidents and how she analyzes putin as seeing these different presidents bush obama trump and biden and the ways in which they have been uh, manipulated or in Biden's case not manipulated because he's actually seen what's happened with the previous three presidents said I'm not gonna uh, that's not the game I'm gonna play so it's actually an interesting shift away with the Biden administration and the team he has on board which is not playing the games that Putin wants to play and that has underscored America's response to Putin and his invasion of Ukraine. It it wasn't the kind of weak response that we saw maybe of Obama in Syria and in Crimea. It wasn't a weak response in terms of Georgia, Chechnya, all these other instances where the rest of the world has kind of said, oh, that's really naughty and not really done anything about it. So but Biden has been, whatever you think about Biden, he is, you know, demonstra demonstrably had a different um foreign policy toward Putin and Russia. Uh, but it's interesting, and she has some really fascinating insights to see how Putin, as this kind of great communicator, has had uh, in in manipulating, you know, the number one in America for the last three administrations. Now, I want to say, if you're not a fan of me having a go at your favorite president, whether that be Trump, Bush, Obama, whatever, just suck it up for this because this is, uh, I'm not having a go at these. I, well, I'm not even doing this. This is her just saying how those three presidents have been clearly manipulated. Or I, I, I don't know that Obama was manipulated. I think Bush and Trump were manipulated. I think Obama, Obama was just seen as weak by Putin. You know, whether you agree with that or not is a different matter. But the fact that he didn't react in in those scenarios I just talked about, he, he was seen as weak by Putin. Did Obama just was weak in the, in the same way that parents for, or teachers, when you say, right, if you do that, I'm going to do this, okay? don't do that or I'll do this. And then the kid does that and you're like, oh, I don't really want to do that thing I said I was going to do because that's there's going to be an explosion here and there's going to be a big argument. Actually, oh, okay, just don't do it again. And that's basically what happened with the red lines in Syria and with Crimea. Like, don't do that. That's our red line. You go over that red line, we're, we're going to react. Oh, you've gone over the red line. Dang, that means we're going to have to have a war. Yeah, okay, we'll just put some sanctions on you, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's, uh, that was Obama's way of not quite being manipulated by Putin. Well, I suppose you could call it that, but just, just not being strong enough in, the, in those contexts. But Putin, well, you, you'll hear about this. So he's, and in fact, going back to John Sweeney, John Sweeney talks about this. Putin, every time he meets people, he, he manipulates them. She says he's a, an expert in communication. I think John Sweeney talks about this, where he's like supposed to be, uh, the, he's an expert in communication. That's one of his fortes. But by that, it doesn't mean that he can uh, like, like speak to you in a way that you would understand. He speaks to you in a way that you really like the way he's speaking to you, and he's therefore able to manipulate you, that kind of communication. Or take Angela Merkel, who he knew was afraid of dogs, and they had some big summit meeting, and he accidentally left the door open, and that big black Labrador, Labrador came in or whatever, big black dog came in, and she was absolutely petrified. And he is like, nah, you know, this is his way of manipulating her. She's then afraid and on the back foot, and then let's have this meeting. And and he does that all the time. He, as as you'll find out, he's done that with Bush, Trump. 
you know, uh, everyone. So anyway, see what she has to say here. He, this friend starts asking him, but what is it you really do? What is it you really do in the KGB? And Putin tells him, I'm a specialist in communicating with people. And this is something that this friend keeps repeating later. He says, my friend is a specialist in communicating with people. And you see it later when Putin starts communicating with American presidents. You can see how he shapes himself in accordance with whoever it is he's talking to. So when he meets George W. Bush, he knows that he's talking to a born-again evangelical Christian who has had a literal come-to-Jesus moment. And so in one of his first meetings with George W. Bush, he brings this little cross that means a lot to him, where that his mother uh, took to Jerusalem to have it uh, sanctified in Jerusalem, that he used to wear all the time and happened to survive a fire at his family dacha where everything, everything in his house burnt up. He barely survived. He had to basically um, repel out down the house uh, on a sheet naked in order to get out in time. And one of the only things that survived this house fire was this little cross. And he brings it to his meeting with George W. Bush and tells him this story about how his mother, who barely survived the siege of Le Leningrad, his mother who lost one son to disease in infancy, another son to hunger during the siege of Leningrad, who had him at an impossibly old age of 41, had him secretly baptized in the Soviet Union, how much her faith meant to her, even in the godless Soviet Union, that she gave him this cross, and then she then went and sanctified it in Jerusalem at the at the Savior's grave. I have no idea whether this story that, that Putin is spinning here, this yarn, is in any way uh, true. But I mean, he knows who his audience is, right? And that this ha and that this cross then miraculous miraculously survived a massive house fire when nothing else did, and it made a massive impression on George W. Bush. And after that is when George W. Bush says, "I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul." Boom, bish bash bosh. There you go. And the desired outcome there is Bush saying, this guy's a good guy, I trust him, I, I can see he's got a soul. Right, I've got you on side. Now, I can start using that connection. So because he, because, because he's a specialist in communicating with people. It's amazing because he often sends the other signal, and we've heard people tell us about meetings that he has where even at the same period, even in 2001 with Americans, where he is standoffish and he does the famous Putin slouch and he's argumentative, but it's all part of him projecting power in one situation or trying to win somebody over. He's that calculating in what he does. Remember, for him, projecting strength is important. He grew up in a rough neighborhood. He grew up on the streets. He was always very short, very slight in stature, which is a liability in the places he grew up. And he talks about how he grew up on the rough streets, kind of scrabbling, that he was a punk, that he didn't get into the pioneers because he was a punk, because he had so many disciplinary problems, and that he then took up judo in order to compensate for this, right? And so you have to constantly be projecting strength so that people don't mess with you. And so... It's so important to understanding what Putin does and how he does his international diplomacy. And it's everything is about projecting strength, even when he doesn't have strength. So second greatest army in the world is a paper tiger, right? But we didn't realize that until, you know, it came to be that there was a war. I'm going to use nuclear weapons. We didn't realize he wasn't going to use nuclear weapons until we went past those red lines. And it's all about projecting strength, even when he doesn't have it. Oh, he's clearly trying, on one hand, to kind of get through the armor, to endear himself 
to an American president, but also trying to project strength, right? So don't mess with me, but also you can trust me, but don't mess with me. So he's trying. This is so, so spot on for trying to understand how, how Putin works. I swear it is. Trying to do both. And again, with George W. Bush, who was the very first world leader to call George W. Bush on September 11th, 2001? It was Vladimir Putin. And what did he say when he called George W. Bush on September 11th? He said, you know, I'm so sorry, et cetera. But he said, we've been facing terrorism from radical Islamists for years now. Now you know what we've been facing. Let's work together on this. And that's where this uh, counterterrorism cooperation between the U.S. and Russia grew out of. And it was one of the very last things to go when Russia invaded Ukraine. It was one of the only things to survive the invasion of Crimea in 2014, the poisoning of Sergei Skripal in 2018. It survived all these things, including, you know, the meddling in the American election in 2016. It started that day on September 11th when Putin called to say he was sorry, knowing, you know, that if he beat the crowd, if he... And by the way, when we talk about meddling in the, the uh, 2016 election, don't just think, Oh, Robert Mueller report. It didn't say anything. M Rob, it didn't. It didn't find it. it. Robert Mueller report found a whole load of stuff. R read what's actually in it, and it found that there was a shed load of problems. It's just you can't like collusion is a really vague thing. You can't go through the courts to do that with any great ease. Yada yada yada. All the all the things. But you know, understand that it was meddling in that election because of course there is because Russia have meddled in all and any number of elections and, and stuff like that. I mean that the realization that it, it's much cheaper to do warfare like that and much more effective than do warfare like the Ukraine war, which is hugely costly and costly and look where it's got Russia now. Like those kind of information warfare, fifth generation warfare, um in the information space, meddling meddling with electoral processes and democratic institutions via the internet and via you know the virtual space against losing hundreds of thousands of soldiers and material in in a matter of months. You know what one's more effective? Okay, the former and yeah. He made it first. He would make a big impression on the American president. And that if he made himself relatable, if he made the American president understand that the Russian people have also been dealing with terrorist threats and terrorist attacks, that he could forge some kind of alliance between Russia and the U.S., and that it would make them peers rather than have, make the American president look down on Russia, look down on the Russian president. Fascinating. So then, then let's just skip it through to... Uh, this next part, which is about uh, George Bush. The Iraqi government, and that you would unleash chaos because you can't just do that. You can't just topple a government um, and not replace it with anything. That everywhere America goes, it brings bloodshed and chaos. That it's just imposing its will on other countries. That this has nothing to do with democracy. That America is hypocritical, et cetera. Again, very reminiscent of the speech he gave in February of 2022. But unlike in February 22, nobody took him seriously because Russia in 2007 was just not a serious player on the global stage. And that only reinforced Putin's drive to be taken seriously. So now we're going to move to uh, post-Iraq. So Iraq was, a, I think, a, a time when Putin maybe felt a little bit insignificant or uh, powerless because it was like no don't go into Iraq don't go into Iraq ah oh, and America just went into Iraq because America's like well I don't care what you think uh and when it did that and Britain went along with them uh but then post that you had the whole Georgia thing and uh we'll, we'll rejoin what she says about They're that are going in the world right um it's yeah, it's amazing that sort of inattention or not knowing what's going on. And at the very end of the Bush administration, the last real conflict and thing that you can look back on from trying to understand Ukraine is Georgia. Before that is this question about Georgia and Ukraine and being admitted to NATO at this point where Bush has got his freedom agenda and apparently is one of the, you know, inside the White House 
there's an argument about it, but he feels pretty strongly. And 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 Putin and Putin tells him in Bucharest exactly what he thinks and what he thinks to this day. He tells him, George, what are you doing? Ukraine is not a real country. It is something he believed all along, and it, he believes it to this day. You know, it, it is something that is now echoed across all of Russian propaganda that there's no such thing as. Ukraine. There's no such thing as Ukrainian culture, as Ukrainian language. It was all just made up in the last 100 years or the last 20, 30 years. How many times have I shown you videos of the propaganda saying exactly this? And Putin was expressing it openly to George W. Bush in 2008 at Bucharest. He said, George, this is not a real country. And how important was that decision? There's obviously, we've talked to people, and there's a debate on both sides about whether they should be admitted or not. But but in the end, it's a <clears> compromise <throat> that they're going to make a statement about it, but it's not a, they're not going to be immediately part of the application process. How important is that decision? I think it's massively important in that this compromise was the worst of both worlds for both Georgia and Ukraine. It left them both massively vulnerable to the invasions that would both come for both of them. It basically waved the red flag in front of the bull. It was extremely provocative for Russia. Russia said it would be provocative. It asked NATO to please not do this. NATO did this anyway under the leadership of George W. Bush. It provoked Russia and made Russia angry specifically at these two states. But then NATO did not provide any protection for these two states. So then it then left them basically twisting in the wind right in the path of this bull that it had just provoked. And what ends up happening just a few months later is Putin invades Georgia, very quickly lops off 20 percent of its territory, which it has still not gotten back. And the U.S., NATO, the West does absolutely nothing about it, which then shows Putin that he can do the same thing in Ukraine, that he can do the same thing in his backyard. It's We're trying to understand why Putin went into Ukraine thinking all this stuff would, would happen and it didn't happen. But also, like, imagine the world wouldn't do anything because actually Syria, the world didn't do anything. Georgia, the world didn't do anything. Chechnya, the world didn't do anything. Ukraine, Crimea, the world didn't do anything. So he's got, there's good form there. Even if it goes a bit bad in Ukraine, the West is still not going to step up there and might put a few sanctions on, but we, we've we actually coped with sanctions. The 2014 sanctions, yeah, they did hit us hard, said Russia, but actually we learned to live within those sanctions and actually things are, things are fine now and and the food, we can't get food from here, so we we make food in this particular way. We can't do this, so we're going to make that in that particular way. And all these kind of things are like, oh, okay, we've coped. It's a reassertion that this is his so-called near abroad, his backyard, the former Soviet colonies, these places that he thinks still belong to him and to Russia, that he can get away with lopping off chunks of territory from them, and that when the U.S. says, we'd like them to join NATO, but not right now, that means probably never, and they'll probably never do anything. Um, it deepens this process that you see, uh, that you see in Putin after this point, which is this quest to show the hollowness of Western institutions, the hollowness of Western rhetoric, this idea that the West is decadent and weak and lacks the manhood to back up its words with actions, that the West will threaten, it will say, we will do this and we will do that, but if Putin were to actually cross a certain line, they'll be too scared to do anything. And that's why I think he'll often now drop the nuclear threat because he thinks it will, again, get into Western heads, American heads, and make them back down because he believes Westerners are cowards and feckless and, again, lacking in the manhood to do anything um, to back up their rhetoric. 
and of course that is entirely correct and this was recorded in september but since then actually there's been this realization in the west that no he's not going to do the nuclear thing so he's drawn his red lines and everyone's gone up to the red line and actually gone over the red line and putin hasn't done nuclear so that's actually worked in the in the opposite way so but this is a really good analysis of of, of everything i think that that that's happened i'm uh, just going to p- play you this tiny little bit um so much so much in this that's worth watching and okay that was the last guy and we ran on being anti last guy right obama so this is the idea that a great reset was going to happen obama took over and said right we're going to reset this relationship with with russia uh, and Hillary Clinton had this big reset button that was mistranslated or whatever. I think she she talks about this. So uh, they're going to have this big reset, um, but then this gives an opportunity for for uh, Putin to establish himself again. Iran on being the anti-Bush, on the idea that had he been president, he wouldn't have gone into Iraq. He wouldn't have made a lot of the aggressive foreign policy decisions that Bush had made. And so let's just, you know, take a step back, take a breather, and let's reset our relationship with much of the world, including with Russia. And so you have Secretary of State Hillary Clinton arriving in Moscow, standing there with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with this giant reset button where, ironically, it says not reset in Russian, but overload, because they misspelled it. It says Piregruska, which means overload rather than reset. And he, he, you know, Lavrov points it out to her and they have a real, uh, like a good laugh on camera, but they press it anyway. And the idea developed by Michael McFall, who then becomes the ambassador to Russia for the Obama administration a few years later, is that we can have dual track engagement with the russian government we can so this is about resetting relationships with with the whole world like you might not realize if you're american that actually you know the bush administration relationships with other countries otherwise you know allies of of the us are basically sad a little bit um bush wasn't seen in the rest of the world as as a particularly good president he was more of a sort of um yeah he a lot of people you know media over here would take the mickey out of bush quite a bit um so you might not realize that in america but that's good so obama thought okay our international diplomacy we lost a lot of soft power around the world so we're going to reset so this was this kind of great reset with not just with russia but with the whole world and uh, and yeah but the putin then can see this approach and think right this this uh, this is an opportunity for me to take some advantage so we're going to skip talk skip, about on skip forward a little bit just to see what uh what she thinks putin's opinion of, of obama was and it's a fascinating insight into putin and, and and i guess the russian kind of way of thinking um so here we are that point about the American president and the response? I think one of the things that's worth noting is is just how differently um, Putin saw Obama and how to Putin, Barack Obama was young and naive and black. And all those three things were very important. Uh, Putin is from a generation of Russians who are extremely racist. So there were a lot of um, there were a lot of lectures that Putin read to Barack Obama that staffers called the airing of grievances. Pretty much every phone call between Putin and Obama began with like a forty-five minute lecture that basically didn't happen once Joe Biden became president. There was not a lot of respect that Putin, that Lavrov, that a lot of people in the Russian government and in Russian society had for Barack Obama because he's black. There were a lot of extremely racist memes uh, going around Russia, amplifying 
Barack Obama's black heritage, equating him to a monkey, showing him eating a banana, etc. Just extremely vile, racist memes that were echoed in the Kremlin. The fact that he was also quite young and idealistic made Putin see him as kind of a Gorbachev type, somebody who could be rolled, somebody who could be uh, outmaneuvered quite easily, uh, somebody who could be filibustered. He didn't have a whole lot of respect for Obama. He saw him as, as weak and as somebody he, he could make quick work of. And you think that went into his calculation and deciding that he was going to seize Crimea, that he didn't see Obama as a threat? I'm, I'm sure he did. I'm, I'm sure he thought that, uh, that given how Obama didn't respond in Syria, the way that Obama didn't enforce his own red line in Syria, that Obama said, you know, uh, Mubarak must go and then did nothing about it, that Assad must go and then d didn't do anything about it, didn't enfor enforce the red line he drew in Syria. I think he figured there wasn't all that much he was going to do um, if he invaded. And this is the kind of idea, I don't want to commit uh, to an armed conflict because I was so anti-Iraq and everything the 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 uh, the, the Biden sorry that ah, the Bush administration did with regard to Iraq and I'm not that and so when it came to the decision to make these to as to whether to commit you know armed forces and whether to hold people to account for for crossing these red lines you know Obama was reticent to do that to Ukraine and snapped Crimea off there's this phone call we had in the first film of Obama talking to Putin, and he just lied to him and says, Manila, the little green men, they're not ours. And Obama says, of course we know they're yours. Is that what explains why Putin would do something like that with Obama? Yeah, he thought he was um, a young, stupid black man. It's, it's kind of the long and the short of it. And the response from the Obama administration to what happens in Crimea, to what happens in the East, what lesson does Putin take from that? The lesson Putin takes from the sanctions and the pushback that he gets from Europe and America in 2014 is that these are sanctions that he can work around. She goes on to explain how Russia, like I hinted at earlier, Russia was able to work around these sanctions. And in, in the end, you know, they weren't as, as terrible as perhaps the United States and, and others were hoping. Um, and therefore not really a deterrence for doing that kind of thing again. And then we get on to um, to Trump, uh, and it's worth seeing how Putin, you know, approached his dealings with Trump, how he saw Trump. Um, Especially on NATO to start, what is he seeing and how is he perceiving Trump? So Putin, as somebody who is, again, a specialist in communicating with people, sees Trump as a very easy subject to manipulate. Somebody who is vain, somebody who is easily distracted, somebody who uh, is quite stupid. And he, I mean, he is constantly manipulating him. There are stories of Putin purposely bringing a young, beautiful woman as a translator with him and then showing her off to Trump and saying, see, look at her, and, and Trump being completely distracted by this young, beautiful woman. Uh, the fact that Trump speaks in short, simple, declarative sentences and th that Putin can understand, that that's his level of English, that gives him extra time to speak and formulate his thoughts back to while the translators are working, that gives him extra time to formulate his thoughts back to Trump. The, the vanity that he sees in Trump, that he can flatter him, that he can say, oh, he's a colorful person, and that it gets mistranslated as brilliant. And then Trump thinks, oh, this, this strong leader of a superpower that has nuclear weapons thinks I'm brilliant. You know, that, that just a couple compliments will go such a long way with this man, uh, that he can basically... Which we know, I mean, if, if you know from seeing Trump talk, he always, always talks about how other people's, when other people say nice things about him, that comes out again and again and again. This person thinks I'm this, this person thinks I'm that. It's hugely important to him. 
his security services can try to influence an election that and that Trump is then um, and influence it in Trump's favor and that Trump is then told about it and Trump loves him forever as a result uh, because he sees Putin as his ally right it's it's all of this is allows Putin to just constantly be eating his lunch right and there's n there's nothing more successful for a uh, a foreign leader of, of a, a kind of enemy superpower to sit back like after Helsinki that time in Helsinki where Putin and Trump are standing together in a press conference and Trump says and I think this is the lowest point of Trump's uh, you know whole administration when he stood there and and said, I believe Putin over my own intelligence services. Imagine you are working for the intelligence services in, in, in America and you're doing everything for, for, we would say in Britain, for queen and country or king and country, right? In America, you're doing it for the constitution, you're doing it for your president, right? And your president says, you know, Putin in charge of basically the Soviet Union as was. Uh, I, I believe this guy over my guys, like, risking their lives to gather intelligence. To me, I, I remember that time watching that that press conference and going, holy shit, that is absolutely astounding. That, that is a victory for Putin. Like, he must have gone home and just like, right, crack open the caviar because I've just won. I, I haven't won on a battlefield. I don't need to do that. Like, the president of the US has just believed me in such a way that he's promoted me like the leader of Russia above his own intelligence services. Putin knows this very well. And everybody who was in the room with them ever just saw how masterfully Putin manipulated Trump. Trump always thought that, you know, they were two guys, two equals, two strong men, just, you know, gabbing it up and dividing the world and conquering it. But everybody could see that Putin didn't hold Trump in particularly high regard, that he saw him as gullible and stupid and easily manipulatable, and that he was just, you know, the Russian expression that he was just, you know, making ropes out of him, just braiding him like a braid, just... Did he see Trump as weakening the United States, weakening <clears throat> NATO? Me. Absolutely. I, on the sidelines of the 2018 NATO summit, uh, I ran into one of Dmitry Medvedev's old advisors, and I said, you know, how do you see Trump back in Moscow? And he said, to us, he looks like a wrecking ball, our wrecking ball. I can't tell you how important that is. And think about what the machinations going on in the Kremlin would have been at the time. So like here we've got this guy that, that to us is a wrecking ball, a wrecking ball for NATO. He, wa he wants to get out of NATO. He wants to blah, 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 blah. Let's use that. This is exactly as Russia what we want. Now, you can say whether any of the points that Trump was making about other nations not putting their weight with NATO, et cetera, et cetera, have some, some force. But at the end of the day, if you're looking from Russia's point of view, this is like gold dust. They saw Trump as destroying the edifice of America and NATO from the inside without Russia having to do a whole lot themselves, without Russia having to lift much of a finger. The other similarity, too, is the way that Trump talks about both America talks about other countries in that very cynical manner that Putin had. Right. Putin would basically plant talking points with him that Trump would echo. Trump would just say things that Putin told him later in public. He would say, Ukraine is a really corrupt country. Crimea is Russian. Everybody there speaks Russian and wants to be part of Russia. Where did he hear these things? He heard them from Putin, you know, and he would just echo them. It was, it, it was just too easy. And I think because it was so easy, Putin didn't have a lot of respect for him. He was not a worthy adversary for Putin. I mean, and then he watches January 6th happen. And Putin, who had been shaped by the collapse of the Soviet Union and who had watched, um, as you say, in, in Libya, had watched other countries fall, is now watching the U.S. Capitol. What would he be drawing from that? 
I imagine he was delighted to see January 6th. I imagined that he saw a country on the brink of collapse, a, a country that was at war with, with itself, again, without Russia really having to do all that much. That, um, you know, if America was going to war with itself, then Putin could have a free reign in Europe because America would be too consumed fighting with itself, chasing its own tail to do much about it uh, because it was so consumed with its own problems and because it had come to think that the rest of the world was too much of a distraction because of everything Trump had said about how alliances are actually financial burdens, about how NATO was an obsolete institution, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I imagine, I don't have any proof of this, but I imagine that Putin watching January 6th happening was basically for him a green light to, you know, s start start planning things in Europe. So this is about seeing things from another point of view, right? That whatever you think about January the 6th, whether you're Democrat or Republican in America, right? Forget that. Forget whether you think the interestingly some leaked leaked audio has just come out from a Minnesota GOP saying that they knew that the, the election wasn't stolen, but they were going to milk this for um, for all it's worth. And they knew that they could get some political mileage out of this and could get some wins. So, But they'd accepted that it wasn't stolen. They lost the election at that early point. So leaked audio has just come out yesterday, I think, well worth looking into. Um, but that side, whatever side of the debate you're on there with January the 6th, Imagine what Russia are thinking as they're looking on. Imagine what Putin's thinking. How does Biden come in and understand and approach Vladimir Putin as he begins his presidency? So Biden comes into the White House having dealt with Putin already and having dealt with the issue of Ukraine and the war and the occupation of Ukraine already for the last two years of his vice presidency. Not only that, he is a seasoned foreign policy national security insider. From his 30 years in the Senate, his chairmanship of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he's also bringing with him some of the best minds and the top practitioners of foreign policy in the Democratic Party. He's bringing with him Jake Sullivan and Toria Newland and Tony Blinken and a lot of other kind of younger staffers that uh, I think a lot of Americans have never heard of, but who are really, really know their stuff, or really believe in their mission, and are really at the top of their game, and really want to right the ship after four years of the basically damage that Trump has wrought to the ship of state. And because so many of these people have already worked in the Obama administration, and Biden himself has al already worked in the Obama administration, they understand that no reset is possible. This is that's super important. Sorry, I just cut her off there, but that's super important. That the advantage the Biden administration has is that they've been able to. Some of them have been in the Obama, uh, Obama administration and realized that that didn't work. They've seen what what Trump had done. They've seen what Bush had done with regard to Putin. So it's being able to look back on that and say, right, none of the approaches worked with Putin. Putin's now invaded another country. The only way to to react here is to react really strongly, uh, and and to set red lines and then stick to them. And and so say what you like about Biden in any other way. I don't whatever you think about Biden politically speaking on Russia and Ukraine. I think he's done a pretty good job, and most people. Uh, I think would tend to agree with that unless you've really got something against Biden. Some people say he's not being strong enough, not giving enough stuff, but actually he's going to be being advised a lot by the military and those kind of technical things. Do we give a tackums or not? That's not going to come from Biden is my opinion. I said this in a previous video, that's going to come from military advisors and Biden might do a little bit. Of, yeah, okay. But, and rubber stamp it, but that kind of thinking is, is the, the, the more technical stuff is going to come from the military, but in general, there has been a, America has been incredibly strong and I've been really impressed and I've always been a critic of American foreign policy you know, in many contexts, but I think here they are doing a really good job. I'm sure they could do better, 
you know, I'd give them eight Atkins, I'd give them everything. But uh, that is coming. But you know, it's easy as an armchair general and YouTuber to sit here and go, "Well, oh, I should have done this, should have done that." But in in all reality, given where, given the approaches to Putin that we've seen over the last fifteen years uh, plus, this is refreshing. And and yeah, I think America have done a good job. There you go with Putin that every administration before this one has come in trying to do some kind of reset by any other name, some kind of uh, restart of a relationship with Putin. And they understand that that's not possible, that Putin is the same, that Putin says what he wants that he does not see a partnership with the U.S. as possible, and that they have to take him at his word, and that the best they could hope for is essentially containing Russia until Putin goes away and until there's a new government, a new regime in place. That basically nothing constructive, nothing positive is possible while Putin is the president of Russia. That is the mentality that Biden and his foreign policy staffers bring with them to the White House in January of 2021. And then they get this briefing that the forces are mathing, that it looks like an... That's huge. Uh, it, that's true. I mean, that, that, that's a real watershed moment. Like if As long as Putin is in charge of that country, we can't work together. Where there's no reset, there's no relationship going on here. The, 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 Putin either dies or there's a coup or there's whatever, but we ain't we ain't doing any work with him. We're not going to do this. And it, and if Putin messes around with Ukraine, if Putin invades Ukraine, right? You know, shit's hit the fan. Let's sort this out. No, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna have a 2014 over again. We're not gonna have a Libya over again. Yes, we will give you tanks and we will give you high Mars and this and that, Ukraine, because we ain't we ain't putting up with, with this kind of behaviour from Putin now. Um and the very last bit, I know there's been so much, but it's just honestly this is just so worth looking at. Um just go oh, I wish my fingers were better than they are. Right. Oh, sort it. This was dealing with. I mean, so when they do have that summit in June, which was controversial apparently inside the administration, but the reason, as you understand it, was to show a level of respect so that he doesn't have to go and take a dramatic action to get attention. <clears throat> well, he did. He had this massive buildup of troops outside, uh, outside Ukraine on the Ukrainian border that spring in April. And he only starts pulling those troops back once he gets a call from Biden and once he gets the promise of a summit, right? And it's seen as a kind of pacifying of Vladimir Putin. Okay, we'll give him a summit. Fine, if that keeps him from invading Ukraine and if it gets him to draw down his forces, fine. What's it to us? And there was a feeling in the fall that maybe he'll take another summit. Maybe we'll do some more phone calls and maybe he'll take something smaller and he'll draw down his forces again. That maybe we can pull another kind of, another kind of Geneva and get him to back down again. But very soon it becomes clear that this is different for Putin, that he's not gonna take any of the exit ramps that the Biden administration is putting out there for him, that he's blowing through every single exit ramp one by one, and that he's just stepping on the gas harder and harder and harder. And how big a moment is that for Joe Biden? He must be realizing that this could be one of the most significant moments of his presidency, this question of whether Putin is going to invade or not. I think it's a huge moment for, for Biden and his staffers. I think it's a massively frustrating one because this is not what they wanted to be dealing with. They have domestic concerns that they want to deal with. There is the pivot to Asia that 
every administration since Bush wants to do, right? They want to get out of the Middle East. They want to stop dealing with Russia. There are other concerns. There's a whole wide world out there outside of the Middle East and outside of Russia that this White House wants to deal with. They don't want to get stuck here. Uh, and th when they realize that this is going to be the thing that defines their presidency geopolitically, there's a kind of frustration and anger that Putin has kind of trapped them into, into this, that they won't be able to focus on and accomplish all of these big, lofty things that they had been planning for for the, Bi the first Biden term. Really fascinating. So all imagine now all the things you've got, these ideas you've been strategizing for years. Uh, when when you take back control of the uh, of the presidency, right? This is this is what we're going to do domestically. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do with China. This is what we're going to do. Uh, and then this happens, and it just blows everything out of the water, and all your money and budgets going towards this, and all your thought and uh, you know, and it just yeah, it kind of ruins all the best laid plans of. Mice and men have to get a glay. It just, yeah. So you can imagine. Anyway, I've spent an inordinate amount of time on this video, but I think it's really worthwhile. She's an absolutely great mind. I, I I read out an article of hers recently from Puck about um, you know, uh, other stuff and to to do the the economy in Russia. But uh, yeah, she's she's a great mind, and I I really think this is an interesting uh, synopsis of the way that Putin has manipulated these previous presidents to gain get his own way and to project his strength even when that strength actually isn't really there and uh, you know I, I think Russia have been boxing above their weight for quite a long time and this war has actually shown that, that, that they don't have that weight and actually their weight is is really just in the in the natural resources they they have absolutely oodles of but after that, you know, their army's not up to much. You know, Poland could go and invade Russia now and win. That that that's the the state that that Russia are in. This is a fantastic interview. What I suggest is that you actually watch the whole thing in in full. Uh, it's an hour and eight minutes of just really uh, really relevant stuff that is is still perfectly relevant, even though the interview was sort of four months ago. Uh, let me know what you think. As ever, thanks so much for all your support. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Hit the bell, notifications, yeah, 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 yeah all that stuff. Um, really appreciate everything you do for the channel and all the co commentary you give below. Um, thank you, and I'll speak to you tomorrow.
This is a fantastic interview. What I suggest is that you actually watch the whole thing in in full. Uh, it's an hour and eight minutes of just really, uh, really relevant stuff that is is still perfectly relevant, even though the interview was sort of four months ago. Uh, let me know what you think, and over to her with me occasionally chipping in. <laughs> 